Hello and welcome to another bout of unboxing. Today my sparring partner is a friend of mine from university, uh, Walter Kerr. Walter Carr, I've got it wrong already. Um, Walter is the uh, co-founder and director of Oppidan Education, uh, supporting thousands of children through one-on-one -on -one mentoring schemes uh, privately um, in schools around the world. He also sets up the Oppidan Foundation um, to address a shortfall in the current education system. And this year was nominated as a social entrepreneur for Forbes 30 Under 30. Really looking forward to yeah, diving into uh, Walter's journey and perspective on education and the education system. So Walter, welcome to the ring. Harry, thank you for, thank you for having me. No problem at all. Um, yeah, it's uh, always good to just kind of frame these, uh, these chats around how we know each other. But um, yeah, we were obviously um, both students at Durham and uh, you were in the year above uh, myself. But yeah, we were kind of uh, spoke a little bit at university, but it was kind of more of a surface, uh, surface level um, relationship, I'd say. But then the, the, the darts was a sort of yeah, that's it. Problem, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was it arrows. It was mainly around the arrows. Um, yeah, I remember <laughs> remember a few pretty pretty dodgy socials actually. If we uh, <laughs> if we look back, it probably shows just looking at that how how far we've come in, in just, you know, five or five or six years. But, um, but yeah, had a pretty, um, pretty service relationship, but, uh, yeah, Walter just kind of got back in touch around unboxing when the, when the podcast came out and that kind of formed a little, um, talking point for us. So yeah, hopefully, um, on the same page with it, with a few things, but I just wanted to, um, firstly start off by just hearing the kind of the startup story with with Oppidan, like how did how did that come about for you? I know it was pretty soon after you um, left uni, but that I think that'd be a good place to start and to frame the conversation. Yeah, sure. So um, I mean, going back a bit, um, you know, I, the, the the romantic side of the story is to say, you know, age twelve, I knew I wanted to go and do something in education. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's just not true. Um, I had a fairly uh, uh, indistinguishable career at school. Um, went to Durham to read theology, which was never going to be a vocational subject. Um, and then spent about six months in China teaching in a in a secondary school there, which was great fun. I grew up in Hong Kong, so um, it was nice to go back there. Um, Alperdin came about because I spent a bit of time working as a tutor in London and became pretty disillusioned with the whole industry. For context, it's a growing five billion pound industry and it's pretty unregulated and the barriers to entry are almost non-existent. Okay. So the kind of two things that I thought, you know, key to start the business was one, to be personally passionate about the product. So in my case, that was, you know, teaching. But the second one is to have a differing view to the incumbent of that in layman terms, basically thinking I could do a different job. So Oppidan was set up because kids don't have mentors and our business matches adults with kids to mentor them much in the same way that, you know, mentoring happens in any corporate industry. So it's basically trying to formalize the role of a mentor in a kid's life. Basically. Cool. So just to, just to frame it from like sort of your personal point of view, like studying, you know, theology. Um, I don't know whether you had much of a vision for like what you were going to do in like future but did you did you were you keen to start a business like as soon as you could or was that not really on the radar it just was an opportunity that came about no i mean it was totally not it was you know as you know we've spoken about this off air a bit before but you know as as mates rush to you know sign up for as many grad schemes as possible yeah a friend of mine had done 17 i think at one point i had not done a single <laughs> one and i remember a mate saying, well, I think you should work for Willis Insurance, you know, go and do that. And so I Googled, you know, what is insurance? Um, and those are not false modesty stories. I literally just didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. And then one day I was, I was given a tutoring job and it kind of went from there. I was asked to go out to Shanghai and, and, and set up a business there. And I thought it'd be fun or more fun to stay in London and do that. So no link at all between, between university and, and what I've ended up doing. 
yeah it's uh, yeah it's really interesting that i mean uh, like i can definitely yeah resonate with you know just doing a subject at uni that was like totally random and i think yeah a lot of people do that but um yeah it's interesting i definitely want to get onto that like around why or might as well get onto it now is that like why do you think there there is that you know we do these subjects at university that you know we've built up through to school that like that's what you need to go and do and then so many people then then drop that and don't go and kind of use their degree i mean that's that's quite like a big a, a big question like early doors but um what's around that yeah i mean it's 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 probably above my pay grade to comment um <laughs> professionally but i think there are two probably two answers i think like sociologically or like as a friendship group the criteria of our success is basically like city job and early salary and you know there's cliches around that you know we can see with i don't know if you've seen industry but it's a it's a pretty good satire of that early um kind of early life in that world mm. uh, but going back a bit at school um i think generally speaking a lot of schools will push kids down routes which um appease parent bodies and appease um expectations from parents and mm. particularly in the private sector i think jobs you know in consultancy and finance and um and those kind of professional services routes are looked, looked upon more favorably having said that i see a real shift in the next five to ten years in and you can see it already in in kind of more creative roles that people are doing and stuff like you know the great stuff you're doing with unboxing um people taking a step back and saying actually trying to reevaluate what they prioritize um mm. and not jumping in too early to those industries so i don't knock it at all i think those who work in those industries are you know far smarter than us and 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 are, you know doing sort of much better but i think i think to have it as a default is a is a is a pretty dangerous thing yeah that that is that is the really interesting thing so like just sort of jumping back a little bit so you you went to like a, a, a one of the sort of top private schools if i'm if i'm right and then you know durham's probably seen as a you know a top uni like in in our society um and then when when you started um doing some of this tutoring and when you wanted to start up opperton was like was like questioning some of that and all these those things that we've been talking about kind of on your mind at that time or is that something that's kind of as you've started growing the business and building the business like uh, wanting to kind of innovate and and maybe you know make the education system better has that been something that's come more slowly over time yeah that's a great question i think again like with the benefit of hindsight it's very easy to say you know this was always what i was going to do and you know there was always this grand plan to change things yeah. I do. Remember, I do remember going to Twenty First and sitting next to people, and them going, "So, what are you up to?" And I would go, "Well, I'm a tutor," and they would they would look the other way. You know, they'd barely give me a minute's breath. Yeah. And I remember with some good friends, and I would, and I would have to caveat it by saying, "Well, you know, there is a kind of strategy to this," and yeah. they would go, yeah, cool, mate, whatever happens." So there was a slight sense of satisfaction, dare I say, when when um when we got going, but um. Cool. But yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I've talked about this with a lot of people on different podcasts. Is that kind of having to justify yourself a little bit when you take a slightly different path? And I, I actually remember a really funny. Um, I think I ran into you on a tube. Like I don't know if you remember, yeah, yeah. but this was probably a couple of years after leaving uni or something. And I remember asking you what what you did. Like you know, being someone that's quite open minded and probably doing my own things, I was I would have gone with whatever you'd said. But I remember you actually saying that, like, oh, I'm doing. I'm doing this kind of, um, I'm doing opera doing like this tutoring stuff, but like, no, it's, it's, you, you kind of downplayed it like as if it was like, Oh no, we don't need to, to talk about that. Um, which I, which I find it, and it's something that I've done as well, because I just like, it's, 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 there's no point in trying to sort of explain yourself and your grand plan. And you just rather just like move quickly onto other things. So it's, it's interesting when, you do do something that's a bit out of the box or when you're doing something that's a bit different, it's trying to then explain that to your peers can be quite difficult. Yeah. And yeah. And people, yeah, people, um, 
I don't know. I think, um, well, I think the, I suppose one thing with this is that everyone has a view on education. Like when me and you have chatted, you know, everyone, everyone can reflect on their own education. So I think, you know, talking about mentorship and working with kids and trying to direct kids and support kids through their, you know, school choices and then careers. I think people like talking about that and people get massively nostalgic talking about their, their education, either primary or secondary or university. So, um, yeah, I think, <laughs> think if people give me the time of day, uh, I'll, uh, I'll chew their arm off about it. Yeah, anything. exactly. <laughs> well, look how far we've come in a few years. We've gone from yeah. just a, a two minute chat on the tube to full on podcast. So really giving you the time of day now, but yeah, something you said there that I, I, I kind of really wanted to dive into um, was, was around this kind of how school and, and uni traditionally shapes idea of what success is and what um, we feel like we should do in our lives. I think that's like the biggest theme because it's such a big theme of what I'm doing with unboxing. And, and just to frame it, like why I started unboxing for a big reason was that I, f I work very hard at school and uni and I felt like I was sold this kind of story very like loosely. It went like, work hard at your GCSEs and then you'll be a sixth former. Work really hard at your A-levels and then you'll be, go to a great uni. There was always this kind of like work hard now and like s sort of suffer a little bit now and then it will be better. And I kept, I kept buying into that. Like I wasn't, I never really like saw it as a kind of process orientated thing. Um, and then I, I, I went to uni, I did biology, which again was kind of, I wasn't learning from a place of like being super interested and passionate about science. It was like, this is a good subject that sounds good, do it. <laughs> um, and, and then I, you know, worked hard at uni, somehow got to one, came out of uni, um, you know, the world will then be your oyster once you've got your two one. And I, you know, <laughs> was applying to loads of different grad schemes and all this kind of thing. And then six months later, I'm sat in this sales job and I'm absolutely disillusioned with life, you know, watching the clock. And I'm just mm. thinking to myself how like this, this wasn't what people said was going to happen type thing. So that, and then I felt I went, had to go on this big process of sort of like unlearning almost my programming of what success was or what I thought my path in life would be and what would make me happy to actually sort of find out my own like definition of success and what I actually just like sort of enjoyed the process of doing. And that, that yeah. for me was like a real like massive shift in mindset that I had to go through. And I'm wondering whether that was just whether like the school system, uni system is at fault there or whether that's more just, that's just the way it is. And, and it's something that each person has to kind of, unbox at some point and, and like learn themselves so my, yeah my sort of question to you is do you think that like the education system does fall short in that regard um yeah kick off with some of your thoughts and i'm sure we can we can sort of go yeah. on different topics. no it's a great it's a great question um does the education system fall short uh again i mean to comment on that generally speaking uh, I probably couldn't say. I think there are definitely flaws in the education system, um, and and this is going to change massively. I think starting with starting with parents, mm. the priorities parents are setting on schools has changed forever, exacerbated by COVID okay. and and online. So in the next ten years, we're going to see more character education. The, like key proponents of that um, are. Wellington College, who have a curriculum of happiness. Um, so there's definitely a shift towards, um, I guess, unboxing yourself. Um, but the, the, the key driver of change to, uh, to, to change that is getting out of your echo chamber. And um, I would take each school as their own particular echo chamber or each socio whatever each friendship group maybe is your own echo chamber and it it you know you harry you kindly teed me up to talk about what we do at offerden because yeah we perfect. give mentors to kids who have a framework outside of school and outside of family to talk to and yeah. so when they talk to a mentor 
who's got a life as a Times journalist or as a civil servant or as a film director, they suddenly think, hang on, this is kind of cool. You know, my sixth form careers day, you know, we've all been to those really bad careers days of school where you have the like Deloitte tent and then the KPMG tent and then the like, you know, as they were, PeerPoint tent. And, you know, those are the only options. So, um, so yeah, getting, getting kids out of those, those echo chambers is great. We, we have these things called creative careers days where we, um, we basically set up uh, totally random left field jobs, um, mentors rather, who, mentors who have those jobs and they speak to kids from schools. So kids can have like an online discussion with, you know, someone who works, um, like someone who writes scripts, someone who does Netflix, someone who does this and that. And so yeah. suddenly that kind of their, their views are opened a bit. Um, yeah. I, th I think the role models point is, is really good because, um, yeah, that, that was something that I, when I was at uni, it, it seemed like in the echo chamber I was in, of course, this isn't probably really the truth, but the echo chamber I sort of was in is that all the role models that I could see kind of clearly in front of me were the like lawyers, the PwC as the, the Deloitte um, consultants. And, and it didn't, like there weren't obvious like left field or out the box role models that I could sort of click onto. I mean, there were, but I just, you have to go out and find them. <clears throat> so yeah, I think that point of, um, of getting like looking outside the echo chamber and actually realizing that there's other stuff that you can do sounds yeah. ridiculous, but you, you it, don't, you it, is, it's it, it is just like, a, it's a case of like options as a case, rather than a case of, of, of pushing away those, those kind of more traditional career days. You know, we've, we've talked about it. There is nothing more boring than someone who has a different way of life, criticizing mainstream employment. Yeah. It's just a case of like, um, exactly. horizon scanning slightly more before you start your job. And I think, yeah. you know, we have, we have mentors who are 22, 23, 24, who do the mentoring and they use this job as a kind of, almost like an attempt to like diffuse their pressure slightly to earn some money and think actually what, you know, what do I, what do I, what do I really want to do before charging into, you know, four years of PwC? Yeah, ex exactly. And I think on that point, I just wanted to, to talk about maybe some of these, like you, you touched on it, but the, the driving factors, which I think being aware of uh, are, are good to like, see why there's the pressure behind things and you touched on sort of parents and the and the money that that goes into to top education so just from talking from my point of view i think maybe even like on a subconscious level that i think the way that sometimes private schools and then you know unis that are now quite expensive to go to run is that just by definition of there being a big investment there's then an expectation for it to sort of return on investment quite quickly, or at least it sort of feels that way. So the sort of, as you're going through that, the, the uni process and the school process is like, you're doing this because you're going to get this really good job that's going to pay well quite quickly. And it's all going to seem, seem great. And, and on a financial level, and I think that's where some, some parental pressure can come in is if, so you're now that, that kid who's 23 just left uni yeah. and you're thinking like, Oh, I want to ideally like find something that I really love doing and that pays really well, but there's some pressure at play from that kind of money that's been put into your education that then sort of needs to ROI. And in your head, you think it kind of needs to ROI quite quickly. So that I think like kind of forces you into this kind of rushy, you're almost this like we've I've talked about this on another podcast it's like a bit of this like toxic competitive like rush for success and like early quite early on and I think that prevents people from horizon scanning as as you sort of call it and and actually being like I don't need to earn 50k like a year in my second year I can actually like try a load of different jobs that might like and fail a bit like I, I think do you think like that, that failing sort of attitude and mindset is something that's quite difficult for kids to do sometimes when they're. Oh yeah. The, the pursuit of perfectionism is the like key issue with mostly teenage girls. 
Um, so like failing hard, we say is like key. And people okay. talk about it a lot. It's not like a new theory, but like, you know, growth mindset and all that. And you fail hard initially. And um, I, I, I definitely feel like um, if you haven't had it, if, well, um, yeah, I, I feel like those who don't fail find it very difficult uh, as you as you as you get on through school. It's why like, I don't know. That's why, that's why someone who had such a such a such an average school career um i, I guess, quite liberated I, yeah i felt liberated liberated and in that um in that no 100 percent. i i i can definitely I, I think i um read a an article from that matthew syed guy about um something around the like you, you probably saw it about like the exams that were being like done differently because of covid or something and and he was talking about how like there's this complete fear of failure just built into like the whole exam setup and that that doesn't sort of train kids in the right way mm -hmm. yeah it's um but i mean there's a so there's there's like two trends i mean i i'm actually very positive about the changes that are about to happen sure i think like i think on the, like the micro level um you go to a pub, nobody wants to talk about their jobs. And it's almost like a faux pas if you start talking about it, yeah. which didn't happen 10 years ago, which exacerbates the drive to do these jobs that we've just been talking about. And then on the flip side, um, uh, fighting that is you have, there's this great school called Michaela Academy, which okay. is run by this, we should check it out. It's run by this um, uh, powerful woman called Catherine Berbersing, who says entirely the opposite. And he basically says like, don't, it's like post liberal. It's like, don't think about your future at all. I'm going to teach you the regimented steps to getting there and trust me and I will get there for you. And, uh, it's, um, it's deemed the strictest school in England and they had like the best GCSE results that came out of it. And she's gone the opposite view to that. So there are these two trends, uh, and I'm very much positive that there will be a, a move in terms of like vocational education um i think hopefully so, so you're saying that there was one there's one trend which is kind of more like let let the kids fail let's be a bit more like liberal and 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 like hands off almost sort of let the kids learn um, by experience that kind of trend and yeah. then another trend is actually let's like make it more strict and like really like spoon feed as much as possible so they're like two trends yeah you have yeah exactly okay. and that's 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 actually been um that's been played out in the news over the last few days so i it's i guess the right analogy but there was a there was a teacher sacked from uh from from eton actually yeah uh, who, who who was sacked not on the grounds of a lecture he did but essentially he he was running a perspectives course on on um on it was called the patriarchy paradox and uh it wasn't a popular lecture and it's this idea of free speech versus uh well it's not harassment so much but it's like the confines of what we deem acceptable and so right. you have these two conflicting things going on so i think in, in in my tiny world of education that's what we're seeing we're seeing like the kind of modern view that we're discussing which is like pushing out these ideas of failing and of more liberal ideas and then the old school more traditional conservative views tying in as well being re-embedded that's really interesting because getting a little bit maybe even deeper here is, is i see that with with a few different things happening in society like especially around this like covid and how people have reacted to that and what people deem as the right way to react to it and then also with like the vaccine coming out is kind of really making it come to fever pitch and i think there's a lot of what would what would have previously been seen as these like sort of marginalized voices who are kind of a bit like rebellious and they're a bit like questioning of like is this really you know <laughs> it, like do we really need to lock down this much you know is the virus as d deadly as it goes? but then you've got the other kind of like gatekeepers or traditionalists being like of course it's of course it's deadly of of course we need this vaccine take the vaccine like quite an author authoritarian approach so i like i see that as like a really general trend is like some people are going towards more and more author author what's the word 
<laughs> I can't say the word. <laughs> authoritarian uh, yeah. like approaches. And then there's like this kind of rebel rebellion to that, which is like this, like the opposite of that, which is re- this much more like liberal view. So I find that really interesting as like a general trend. But have, have you got any um, examples? I think you did mention one before, like an examples of a school that's taking like a completely different approach, like a completely liberal approach where they're, they're, they're trying to make it a much more like kind of social. Um, yeah. School. Yeah. So um, I, t- I think I touched on it earlier that the, the rise of character education. Yeah. So like edu- character. Yeah. The old, I mean, this is, this is really sort of, you know, Nikki education, but the old uh, <laughs> education secretary, Nikki Morgan talked about like character confidence, resilience, focus, desire, that kind of thing, being um, being caught rather than taught, i.e. like it will happen, like parents are obsessed with confidence. If you could give a kid a, com- you know, a confident pill, you know, yeah. you'd, be, you'd be a millionaire overnight. Right. Um, so schools are, uh, schools are obsessed with, I mean, I, I am too, about um, trying to teach these kind of principles and Wellington under uh, Anthony Selden, Who's, who's like the sort of catalyst of happiness courses. And they, they, they like deliberately teach how you become more resilient, how you become more confident. And there's this narrative at the moment, well, it's been going on for a while, but the narrative on like the development of AI and how in 50 years time, the jobs currently being prepared for in school just won't exist anymore. Mm. So like, how do you make kids in the interim, how do you make them more, you know, resilient or adaptable to that change. Yeah. And it's, 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 there's no easy answer, but I think a good, a good step is to, is to, to have a, you know, to have a life courses um, module to have, you know, it's like PSHD at school or like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's yeah. definitely, there's definitely a trend towards that. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. I read a, um, well, it was one of the, um, the, the sapiens book it was the next one that was talking about like what's going to happen in the future and obviously a lot is kind of you know stick a finger in the air and see which way <laughs> the wind's blowing but um he, he said something that that resonated which was literally exactly that like by 2030 um the the world like the jobs that are going to be here for for humans like are well, what's bit we don't really know what to teach kids in school because like they don't really map to to what people are going to, and I think that's already happening today like you know lo, so many jobs now are around like software building or um you know digital marketing and like they're not things that you're really learning as part of the curriculum although arguably they're like probably the most important when we're talking about like what vocations that kids now are going to go into but so like- but but this is this is the this is the, the the kind of anxiety making thing is that me and you can happily discuss this um, without kids. Now you know you're in a long term happy relationship as am I, and um, and you know I, um, whenever that time comes when we have kids, suddenly this conversation yeah. is just like magnified, and it's not just magnified because you've got kids. It's being played out on the playgrounds, like watching your you know your your daughter on the sports pitch, whatever it is. And like it becomes all encompassing this yeah. conversation about how kids develop. And oh my God, if you know, being a kid at the moment is difficult. Like poor kids <laughs> going through this is just awful. But also being a parent in this shift of, yeah. of narrative, my God, it's difficult. Oh, a hundred percent. I just couldn't imagine like if, yeah, if I had a kid and I was, I was figuring out what like school to send it to, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't know what was the right, (laughs) what was the right choice right now. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. I know I'm, I would slant towards, it's, it's such an interesting um, sort of paradigm shift because I know at school, like when I saw those RPSE lessons, I was just like rubbish. Like, you know, they're not prioritized as like important to, to us. So you just, you treat them as a bit of a joke. But, but now looking back and how I see the world's changing is that like those character um, traits and, you know, being able to think creatively, laterally, being able to, you know, lead and things like that are much, you know, being uh, like learning, you know, how to, to learn new and, and different skills, I think, yeah. are, you know, much more important with, with the way that the world's changing. So, yeah, 
it's it's interesting how it, it is like almost a complete paradigm shift in terms of like what's important and i think that's why some are going more the same way and others are taking the paradigm shift and you know going a completely different way yeah <clears throat> no, i agree yeah interesting to see a player. Well, i just wanted to before we jump into the final round i just wanted to talk about that actual mentorship and and one-on-one that dynamic of the one-on-one um which is something that i really believe in um especially when i was trying to find direction with what to do and just like get get clearer on my thoughts was just speaking to someone neutral um in a kind of one-on-one non-judgmental space i found like super helpful and i think like we've spoken about before where if you're conversing only like in groups sort of situations, you know, group WhatsApps and going down the pond with your mates. It's difficult to be more open and, and actually like speak honestly, you know, about things like work and stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so maybe could you just touch on that? Like in terms of the one-on-one and mentorship and how you use that to help like kids find direction and become maybe more emotionally aware. Um, that is a great question. Um, I mean, that should be front and center of our website if it's not. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I think Elevator like- a pitch. Yeah, no, it probably is. Um, I mean, we discussed like the, the concept of the role, you know, like having someone to talk to, to get you out of the echo chamber. Like, I think, I think generally speaking, that's agreed upon. It comes down to like the skills associated with being a good mentor and having these kind of conversations. There's a pervasive nature in school and in the workplace about asking for help. And uh, it's like my key advice to anyone starting a business is ask help early on. People love to give it and don't be shy about asking for help. But like, but vulnerability is, is like the, I don't know, it seems to me the most, um, uh, the, the most attractive quality to have because, because uh, you know, um, I, I just feel like that, that, that's key for a mentor. For example, our, our best mentoring relationships, let's say that, that have a quality of doing maths help, are from people who say to a kid, I'm very bad at maths. So the kid feels like, okay, I'm okay to be bad at it too. So it, it ties back into the kind of um, failing hard thing. So vulnerability yeah. is a key skill. I think, um, uh, what else? I mean, we talk about empathy a lot with, with mentoring. I think like they're there as a troubleshooter there are a crutch to lean on. I mean, these are all sort of fairly generic trite comments I'm making, but um, uh, are yeah, like, been, tag, been like a, written a few PR uh, PR yeah, yeah, articles exactly. yourself. <laughs> let me let me just, no, let me just I'll be a bit more bit. <laughs> no, no, no. Think, uh, so 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 uh, well, here's the big one. I think uh, is that our tagline is we all need a mentor. Me, you, Johnny yeah. down the road, and the twelve year old kid. Yeah. And you know, Roger Federer has a mentor. Jeff Bezos has a mentor. Yeah. You know, what the founder of Airbnb has a mentor. And if you if you if you if you create that narrative and you instill it in a kid and say to him or her, it's okay to help. It's not remedial. This is not something that is given to you because it's a prescription. You know, tutoring is is remedial. It's prescriptive. It's being yeah. done to solve an issue. Yeah. They are bad at maths. But for a kid to have a this is a real plug, so I'm sorry. But to have a to have a space to talk to, which isn't deemed remedial, is an enormously positive thing. I think. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And I, I really like how you say, just leading on me me a chance to plug my own <laughs> stuff. No, but it, it is how it's not just for kids. Is that like, you know, we, we a kid a, a mentorship even just in schools is is a great thing to bring about. But then actually like being the you know 25 year old or 35 year old and still feeling that you can ask for help and not have it all worked out i think is is a big step and i think you know if you yeah if you can kind of teach kids that having that vulnerability is a is a good thing then who's who's your mentor you uh, <laughs> yeah put me on the spot but um well i worked with a i worked with a coach or like i don't know if coach is the right word I, the terminology around these kind of uh, roles are, are, is quite difficult as you probably know is that like tutor for example has a really bad connotation life coach has a horrible connotation like, oh, we, I think we've spoken about this before but you know I, I, I for me it was like I was 
unsure about what to do in life, I needed someone to speak to who was non-judgmental. And there was, there was a guy who, um, I actually originally got in touch with him around like personal training, but he also did like the sort of mind and, um, I had him on the podcast a few episodes ago, but, um, he also does sort of like mindset and, you know, more like out the box topics, speak to me about whatever you want. And I just found speaking to him occasionally and just letting off like all of my thoughts and getting it out of the bottle was really helpful. So for a, for a sort of transitional period of my life, he was really helpful like as a mentor. Um, but I think I have different ones in different areas as well. Like I try and seek out people who I look up to in certain aspects of life. So in business, I'll try and find like someone who's a really good business coach or has run a business that's similar to mine and try and sort of pick their brains and maybe work with them more regularly. Or then, you know, if I want to get a bit better at tennis, I might ask you for a game and try and, you know, put someone on your backhand and ask you how you did it. We should have. Yeah. We should have. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's very cool. But, um, no, it's been, I know you've got, um, you're a little bit, um, such a, such a busy CEO. You're a bit strapped for time, uh, today. So let, let's jump into the, into the final round. Um, and I've got a few, uh, quick fire questions that I want to ask you and be, be, yeah, try just try and be sort of as honest and as possible and whatever sort of springs to mind first. So I'm actually really looking forward to answer, asking these because they're pretty, um, pertinent for what we've been chatting about so my first one is what's your personal definition of success and what what do you think is a good a good definition to have um autonomy and purpose would be my two okay C can you so i develop or not <laughs> yeah to just develop on that in terms of like I think, um, you know, how, think, how might that, how might that look? Like how might it show up like in, in a, for, for an example, in like a life? Um, it's not, it's not like autonomy in terms of starting your own business. It's just like being autonomous in your, in your, like controlling the narrative, of your, controlling the narrative of your own life. I feel like, yeah, like it. People, people hate being told what to do. So being autonomous in even in your own team or your own, you know, in your own, job whatever it is just just having that autonomy and then and then you know people are motivated by having a purpose beyond what they're doing so i think trying to do that um you know in your case whatever it is making people feel more comfortable talking about themselves and getting them outside the you know the echo chamber of that that sense of purpose beyond you know the the surface is is, is key yep. i think and here's a maybe a slightly more personal just question on in addition to that is like so when you're looking at, at Opperdon like you know in the future um down the line like what what are your key like key things that you're looking for for like okay that's successful like I've done I've done okay. well there with with Opperdon um uh it's impossible not to sound like Brent when you give these answers vis-a-vis <laughs> <laughs> um, -vis. yeah yeah um profit uh, is important so let's just <laughs> i think um from like um from like a strategy point of view uh we want to have mentoring as a system ingrained into every curriculum that a school has so it's to, instead of going to your math lesson you go to your mentor and have that ingrained and that, that's a very simple idea but there's three thousand schools and sorry thirty thousand schools in the uk we work with 30 of them so we've got a long way to go okay doing that awesome my second question is how how will the world be different in 10 years time and for you i want that to be like a specific sort of arrow in on the on the education <laughs> on education and yeah how that'll look what's your uh, prediction uh so um my old how my old headmaster told me this line he said that particularly with, um, well, with education, private education will become a quote, uh, esoteric fashion choice. I had to Google what esoteric meant, but <laughs> yeah. essentially he said that it will just be this like, this like very odd thing that like very rich people have and, and, and continue to use. So I think, I think, um, there'll be, there'll be more crossing the tracks between private and state education, which is a great thing. Okay. Um, so I think that, that's a key one. I think, 
um, you know, more and more schools are going online. So Harrow Online, for example, have just has, has just launched. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think online education will become more um, more apparent as a like learning home balance becomes more blurred. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, and if you know those two trends that we talked about, like going in two different directions. Do, like, do you think that it could potentially be like uh, both? Both will actually become things, and and we can exist in a in a society where there's like two radically different ways to school our children. Or do you think one will win? And if so, like which one would you slant towards? That's a really good question. That is a great question. I um, I oh, let me think. There will always be conflicting views on how to educate kids. You have the conservatives and you have the, you have the traditionists rather than you have the kind of um, more liberal way of thinking. I think, I, actually, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, put a, I couldn't put my, my stamp on it. I'd say that um, increasing polarization will happen. A bit like, you know, you've seen um, that tech documentary. Um, uh, Social Dilemma. That's it. You know, yeah. there's polarizing views which will, which will continue to, to people to, will keep confirming their own worldviews. Yeah. My, my view is just get off Twitter. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then you can make up your mind. I know. Well, but I don't know but, if you tweet. But. Uh, yeah. I find YouTube particularly like interesting in that regard, because your feed will just be like a series of, of people that might educate you in a way that you, that will confirm your own bias. But I, I, I guess that's nothing that like, particularly new because people tend to read books that they're gonna sort of be on the line of thinking that like do you ever read a book that's like completely the opposite of your worldview i don't know um no you probably put it down, probably a good I? thing to do but i don't know yeah, yeah sure. it is interesting to see how it'll go um walter it's been um yeah awesome to have you in the ring i've, I've actually really enjoyed that that conversation i think um yeah, it is really interesting to see where education will go because it's such a it's such a pillar of like everyone's life and therefore, you know, how society will look. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to ask my final question is um, anyone who comes in the ring, um, you don't have a, a track to play you into the ring for, for unboxing, but you actually get one to, to play you out. So what would yours be and why? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me this. Uh, so like the, the like question, well, the answer should be in my industry, it should be Pink Floyd's, we don't need no education. Nice. Uh, I, I have, um, I have a very bad taste in music, like a 12 year old boy's taste in music. Have you just had your Spotify wrapped come up and it's. Yeah. Yeah. Like and it's all, pop. it's all, it's all scouting for girls. <laughs> but, <laughs> So I'd probably have one from that back catalog. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like Elvis isn't dead or something like that. Yeah. No, I like one that's, that's relevant to the, to the, to the conversation. So sh should we go with, with the Pink Floyd one? Let's go Pink Floyd. Yeah. Love it. Thanks very much for uh, coming in the ring, Walter, and, and have a good rest of the day. Harry, thank you for having me.